All right, well, welcome everybody. Please, uh, this will work for me. Hey, some of you know me, some of you don't. Uh, I'm Steve Davis. Uh, I'm still in the Department of Emergency Medicine. I've uh, been there for about 18 years. Uh, in the interim, uh, I'm uh, currently serving as the Vice Chair for Research and Scholarship. Uh, for the department in my more permanent role um, is I'm the director of clinical research for the department. Um, the reason why I have been asked to chat with you today about this is because I've uh, been a member of the IRB for about 10 years now. Um, I chaired it for about four years and as I always like to say I really hope that that will help count towards the penance that I clearly need uh, for you know, those college years uh, as we call them. Um, and so I think, you know what, uh, I'm going to start out with this little video. Some of you may have seen this before, but it's a good one. Uh, it's very short. Uh, it's not one of these, okay, come to listen to somebody and you have a video for you know, a couple hours. Uh, but I think it'll set the stage for what we want to talk about, which hopefully will be very applicable to the test that some of you may be taking, uh, and a refresher to some of the experts I see uh, in the crowd. All right. I appreciate the background, Dr. Epler. Now, if you can please explain what happened. The problem was a case of miscommunication. When one phase of the larger study ended and another began, all strictly according to oversight rules, there was an unauthorized washout period of the previous antidepressant. Meaning that patients were taken off their medications? That sounds different than the story about the dosing that was in the news last night. There has never been a misdosing problem. This study is nearly 10 years old, and we have made valuable contributions to the psychiatric field. All of our protocol is approved by the University Institutional Review Board. Is it true that approximately 10,000 people die every year in the United States because of medication errors? That's not what happened here. There was a change of personnel at the beginning of the new phase of the study, and medication was temporarily withheld. How many patients had a bad reaction? All of the reactions were within the parameters of the study. The patient whose family spoke to the press is doing very well, as are the right others. But how many patients? Dr. Oslo. Good morning. Dr. Oslo, I'm Terry Washington from the Daily Voice. As head of the university's institutional review board, do you have a response to last night's headlines? We're reviewing the situation, so uh, I'm sorry. Neither Dr. Rebler nor I can make any comment at this time. I promise to speak to you as soon as we have the facts. But. Okay. Thanks. I look forward to your call. Thank you. I can't, I can't talk, talk to the to campus, campus newspaper. newspaper. I don't I think, think it's wise. wise. Now, Dan and I have been friends, friends a long time, time. But, but I can hear some things. things. Oh, who's, who's gossiping, gossiping now, now in God? Remember, Remember when we talked six months ago? ago? I agreed to give you some, some space, and, and you agreed to clean up your act. I have. We're using the newest consent forms and rigidly double checking. Danielle, you didn't get approval for this washout from the IRB or the scientific review panel. You must have signed HIPAA forms to do any retrospective reviews on medical records. And you must give participants ample opportunity of consideration. You know the drill. And because the patient with the guardian hit the wall, we have a big problem. Print has messed up. He's, he's my, my new resident, resident and, and he's only been off a few months. months. Pritta? I've, I've been, been through all the paperwork. There is no Pritta on, on this study. study. Yes, I, I know what you're going to say. say. I'm, I'm working, working on the recent amendments and the staff turnover. turnover. It's, it's impossible to keep up with this endless paperwork. We, we have, have three or four new team members here today. I will get the amendments to you by Monday. This is so much worse than I thought. I'm going, I'm going to suspend, suspend the study. study. You, you can't, can't suspend, suspend the study. study. One, One small mistake. We, we had changed a few things, and he was never thoroughly trained on them. Don't, don't tell me that that, that can take my study, study down. down. You, you know, know how hard I've worked for this. I can't believe what I'm hearing. 
I, I, I should, should have, have never agreed to give you a break before. before. And just, and just now, now you've, you've given, given me reason to believe that you've, you've made significant, significant modifications to the study without seeking board approval. That's, that's pretty blatant, blatant Dr. 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 I'm, I'm sure we can get this all straightened out. Please trust me. I think, I think we're well done, done that, that now. now. So that's a bad day, y'all. And hopefully this will set the stage about what I want to cover today, which is really related to the IRB. I want to talk about why we do what we do. We get just a very brief in the IRB history and kind of why do we have IRBs and how did we get to having IRBs and the need for it. But really, most importantly, how we do it, to really get into some specifics related to what happens during the review process what types of reviews there are, and I think something will be helpful um, to this program is to really focus in a little bit on drug and device studies uh, and you know, IDEs and IMDs can get very confused, uh, as many of you know, that work with them. Uh, and importantly, what happens if we don't do it right? Okay, because the video kind of set the stage, but what we never talk about is what happens if we don't do it right. Okay, I was doing clinical research probably for about four or five years prior to being asked quite unexpectedly if I would like to serve on the IRB. Okay, and at that time, I think it's quite fair to say, because I had lived in both worlds, I was like, wow, you know, because I had been on the side of frustration at times. But I think agreeing to serve on the IRB has helped me personally because it, it, it really helped me answer this question, why are we doing what we do, but what happens if IRBs don't do it right? And then if we have time, and we'll watch our time, um, we might do a few case studies where I basically ask you to be the IRB, um, if you want to be on the IRB, and give you some facts and say, how would you decide? You know, what would you do if you were the IRB? I like to keep this interactive to the extent possible, so please chime in. We can go in many directions. I think that there's ample opportunity to cover some of the material. Um, for some of you that may be new, and hopefully for some of you that it's not new, it will be uh, a refresher. Uh, and if not, I'm sure I can duck if you want to throw something at me. All right, so why we do what we do. All right, so IRB history in one slide. Okay, modern IRBs uh, really come out of what happened during World War II, okay, and the Nazi medical research. There was obviously some very horrible things that the Nazis did, primarily to prisoners in concentration camps. Um, ironically, but an important point is many of the scientific questions that the Nazis were investigating were very good questions. It was the manner in which they tested those questions which was unethical and very problematic. Okay, for instance, um, you know they a lot of their fighters would get shot down. Uh, over Russian waters, which obviously were very, very cold. And so they had developed uh, a special jacket to see, you know, would hopefully prevent against hypothermia if you got shot down and you were waiting to be rescued uh, and wouldn't die. Very good question. You know, technology to prevent hypothermia. How they tested that was the problem. They basically took prisoners uh, in the concentration camps, put the coat on them, ducked them in an ice bag, and left them in there until they died. And then they recorded, okay, this is how long they can survive. Okay, so, I mean, there are many examples of this. Similarly, uh, they were concerned with at what altitude their fighter pilots could safely eject. Okay, and so to test that, they put prisoners. In many cases, some of the, I give other lectures where you actually have pictures of this. They actually put a prisoner in with the stripes on, okay, in, in, the chain, in a pressure chamber and slowly decreased the pressure until the patient became hypoxic and died. And at that point, they then reported, okay, yeah, this is probably the altitude at which you don't want to eject. Okay, so it was how they answered these questions that were very ethically problematic. This led to, and this may be on the test, I don't know, but this led to what was called the Nuremberg Trials, where they put the medical physicians on trial, and there were several death sentences and some extended sentences and few wills, I'm not sure why. But most importantly for modern clinical research, this is where we got the Nuremberg Code. And the Nuremberg Code was kind of the first attempt in the modern world to write down what ought to be the guiding principles 
to research with human beings. What ethically, ethical principles should be maximized in research with human beings? And when I give this talk, you know, and, and, and I, I, I like to say, well, good thing that that happened across the pond, right? You know, but the problem was is that we had our own problems. It wasn't just over in Europe that these things were happening. It was actually in the United States as well. How many of you have heard of Henry Lax? Very famous case. So Henry Lax was an African American lady. Uh, that presented to Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, that she had cervical cancer. And at that time, Johns Hopkins in the 1950s was the only hospital that would treat African Americans for many conditions. Okay. Uh, during her stay, they, you know, they took some cervical cells of her cancer unbeknownst to her for research purposes. Okay. In and of itself, not a horrible thing. The problem is they didn't <coughs> help. Okay. And these cancer cells are to this day still growing. Okay, it created an immortal cell. So there's an amazing book. I teach a class where I have my students, my honor students, read it. It's called The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, written by an investigative journalist. Awesome read, and it talks about you know her whole plight. Uh, Jonas Salk used these cells to create the polio vaccine. There's something like 60 tons of them now estimated to exist, and all the while her family still can't afford them. Okay, which is a social justice issue, but the problem is, and the take-home point is that we had our problems here. Tuskegee is probably the most famous. How many of you have heard of Tuskegee? So what happened in Tuskegee? We've heard of it. That's great. That's right, right. So Tuskegee, what happened was, is they didn't actually infect poor African American farmers. You know, Tuskegee, Alabama, they didn't infect them. Syphilis. What they did is they their research question was. They wanted to study the untreated course of syphilis. Okay, not a bad research question in and of itself. The problem is, well, there's two main problems with this. Untreated syphilis can cause some very, very nasty things to happen. Obviously, okay, up to and including death. All right. They didn't tell them what they were doing. That's problem number one. They thought they were just getting free medical treatment. The problem number two, which is why it's one of the most egregious violations of research ethics in existence is in 1940, this started in 1932, in 1940 penicillin was discovered as a cure for syphilis. They didn't offer it to me. They ran this study until 1972, and it was funded by the United States government. More recently, they found out they did a similar thing actually in Guatemala, except there what they did is actually sent infected prostitutes into the prisons to copulate with the prisoners you know, so that they could contract syphilis, and then they were testing various, uh, you know, pharmaceuticals, and it's probably in part where they found the penicillin was. Problem is, is that we had a problem over here. Okay, so you have the Nuremberg Code. Okay, the World Health Organization adopted something similar to the Nuremberg Code in 1964 called uh, the Declaration of Helsinki. Okay, but over here, of course, in America, we're like, well, we need to kind of do our own thing. Okay, it's the American way. And so in 1974, we had the National Research Act. Uh, and this is where we got our fees. Okay. Obviously, how a law happens in the United States is the law is passed, and then it has to be codified. Right? And that can take a couple of years. Okay. And so in the course of codifying the law, um, there was also a directive in the law to get some experts together to meet and to decide what ought to be the guiding ethical principles for research in human subjects. Okay. This happened in what's called the Belmont Report. Does anybody know why it's called the Belmont Report? This is where I like to give you free final jeopardy material. So it's called the Belmont Report because they met at the, this National Commission of Experts met at the Belmont Conference Center at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. The Belmont Conference Center doesn't exist anymore. I guarantee you will not be asked that on the test. But if you're ever on Final Jeopardy, shout out to WD. That's all we got. So, quiz time though is what are, so there's three main guiding ethical principles okay, uh, that, that all research conducted on or with humans should maximize. What are they? You can just shout them out if you know. Respect for persons. Respect for persons. And what is respect for persons? It's fundamental. It should be counted for. 
you, you tell them what they're going to do. So it's oftentimes, this is why we do informed consent. Mm -hmm. You know, the ethical principle, which some people also refer to as autonomy, basically says that people ought to determine their own destiny. Okay, that obviously didn't happen in a lot of Nazi medical research. Most of the prisoners couldn't decide, okay, what was going to happen to them, and they actually weren't even given, given information about risks and benefits. So, very good. Respect for persons autonomy. What's the second one? Anyone? Beneficence. Beneficence, yes. I have a thankful for spell check because I could never spell it right. So, what, what is beneficence? See, I told you this is interactive. I mean, this is like the noon hour, talking about IRBs. The benefits should outweigh the risk. That's right. That's right. And, you know, if I have to start dancing, I will. But, you know, you probably don't want to see that. So, beneficence is the idea that when we do research with humans, okay, the benefits should always outweigh the risks. At a minimum, they should be equal, which is to see that maximize benefits and minimize risks. And the third one, and I'm going to have slides on this, but I like to be interactive. These slides will be made available to you as well. And the third one. Justice. Justice. And justice is? You have to recruit equal number. Well, yeah, so justice actually has two sides. Okay, Justice is the, the idea that no one group in society should be targeted. Okay. Now, what people think about, there's two sides to that point. People usually think about the first definition of justice, which is no one group within society should be targeted to shoulder the burdens of research. Okay. And what often comes to mind? A scheme comes to mind. Okay. Targeting like minorities at times is a very egregious example. The problem is, is that there's another side of justice that we don't talk about. Because justice also says that no one group should be unfairly excluded from the benefits of research. What group universally is usually excluded from the benefits of research? Have you guessed? Sure. Sorry? Prisoners, Prisoners um, are excluded. To the extent that they're excluded, it's probably because they have a lot of protections now, which we're going to get into precisely because of what happened in the medical experiments that the Nazis did. Uh, what I usually say here is children. Okay? Children are usually excluded from research, especially like drug studies or other medical studies, because you know it's, it's logistically more challenging to do research with kids. Kids are, are seen as having uh, diminished autonomy. Okay, so that's the other side when we talk with respect to persons, that the people ought to be able to determine their destiny, and those with uh, diminished autonomy deserve additional protections. And so children, because they are seen as needing additional protections, it's logistically hard, as many of you who have done uh, clinical research for years know, because you have the parental consent form, a lot of time drug studies don't even want to roll the dice, because if something happens to kids, that might make the nightly news. Okay, so by one estimate, I, mean, I did some research for a chapter uh, I wrote on ethical issues and pharmaceutical research, and it was by one estimate somewhere between 50 and 80 percent of pharmaceuticals that we have approved today for marketing. We don't have any information, at least from the studies that led to the approval, on how they work in kids. Because after a drug is approved, you can then prescribe it off late as a physician, which means in kids. Okay, so that's just something as well to think about is that it's both sides of justice. It's just unfairly targeting to shoulder risk or unfairly excluding the benefits. All right, so that's the Belmont Report. And then the codified part of the National Research Act of 1974 was in 45 CFR 46. Okay, this is essentially what institutional review boards use as a blueprint. And I debated today, we were talking about this a little bit before it started, but I don't think, obviously, you're going to be tested on it, but I can tell you, for the first time since probably, I'm thinking, the early 90s, uh, 45 CFR 46 is being revised. However, those revisions don't go into effect until next January. So I didn't want to, I'd be happy to talk about that after we get done with this, but I didn't want to, like, you know, confuse you over some of the changes that are probably coming. But just be aware that there are some changes coming because they are finally revised, like I said, the first time in 25 years. I think it was like 1990, 91, and before that it was like 1981. 
reconfigured in 1974, then it takes several years to you know, codify. But this is essentially, and there's a lot of text on these slides, and I do this so that you can go back and read if you want, okay? But this is essentially what IRBs use when we figure out how are we going to review research, okay? And how are we going to, and everything goes back to 45 CFR 46. All right, you don't have to remember like various sections of the code. And again, this is breaking the PowerPoint etiquette that you're not supposed to have about the text. I do this on purpose so that you can go back later and look at it before you ask if you want. Okay. The 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 take-home point from the bolded text there is that 45 CFR 46 applies to any technically applies to any research conducted in the United States that is funded, you know, okay, or under the oversight of the federal government. I can tell you in reality, most institutions, including most major universities and probably even private research organizations, anyone who is doing research in the United States uses 45 CFR 46 as a guide. Even though technically it might be a little bit more narrow to whom it would apply, this essentially is the blueprint for research done you know, on human beings in the United States. Okay. Um, so that is kind of why we do what we do. You know, hopefully I've impressed upon you that there are very bad things that happen. They happen in Europe, they happen here. The Nuremberg Code was because of the Nazi medical research experiments. The Declaration of Helsinki was the World Health Organization's version of the Nuremberg Code. And over here, of course, we've got the Belmont Report with the three major ethical principles in 45 CFR 46, which is where it's formally codified in the National Research Act of 1974. So that's why we have IRBs. I mean, the take-home point is that professional ethics were no longer good enough okay, to, regu to, to, to regulate themselves. Okay? Typically, we would say, okay, you're a professional looking at medicine. As a profession, we are going to go ahead and give you the leeway to regulate yourselves. In research, that just didn't work. And that gave us all the problems and part of why we got IRBs. Okay. All right, questions on that? I'm not trying to start answering it, hopefully not. You, know, you cannot see that. You cannot see that. All right. This is how we do it. This gets into, and there may be a lot of material uh, on your exam related to some of the specifics. Um, so we're responsible then, and, 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 and really it's not, it shouldn't be a mystery that it is, because I've been on the other side, you know, just being a researcher at the end. But essentially, when IRB reviewers review protocols, we are looking at the protocols to see, are the three main ethical principles maximized? So we're looking at consent forms to see, and is respectful persons maximized? We're looking at the overall protocol and procedures to see, do the benefits outweigh the risks? Okay. And justice is always a consideration just to make sure that you're not unfairly targeting or excluding okay, a study or a, a group of people from research. This is what we're doing when we review all protocols. Okay. Um, and we're also looking at specifics in 45 CFR that we uh, will um, get into. Now this is this joke is probably getting a little dated, but you know, I still use it anyway, so my apologies in advance for some of you that may have heard it a few times. But this is basically, I always ask, do we have any South Park fans? It's been more than 20 years now, can you believe that? Are we familiar with South Park? Okay, this is the Eric Carlin authority cap statement. Okay, basically this shows that right in federal regulations, the IRB has the authority to approve, review, approve, require modifications, or disapprove all research. Okay, and so that's just everything is rooted in 45 CFR 46, including the IRB authority. All right, so criteria for approval of research. Risks of subjects are minimized. Which of the three is this? What ethical principle is it? Got a 33 percent chance. <clears throat> Beneficence, right? Okay. Risks of subjects are reasonable in relation to anticipated benefits, right? Beneficence. Selection of subjects is equitable. This is this is the criteria. Again, that I already got this. I'm not making this up. When we reduce protocols, we are looking, do they maximize? The three cardinal ethical principles of research. Okay, which one is this? Justice. Justice. Got it. This is easy. Informed consent will be sought. This is an easy one, right? Respect for persons. So you can see right away when we look at whether or not we can approve a study. 
The criteria ultimately go back to the three principles in the Dion report. Okay, that's what we're doing. Vulnerable populations are an important point to mention uh, because the regulations recognize that there are some populations that may have diminished capacity or otherwise be vulnerable to coercion and violations of justice if they could be easily targeted for research. And so because of that, there are actually some vulnerable populations that have their own subparts. Okay, so you've got 45 CFR 46, and then you have subparts. Okay, and you can see there some of the vulnerable populations, prisoners, obviously that comes straight out of the Nuremberg Code from what was done. Uh, you know, in, in Nazi medical research, but prisoners are considered to have diminished autonomy, or you know, they, they don't have the right to decide. Their movement is restricted. And so because of that, if you want to do research on prisoners, um, they have additional protection. I would tell anybody, if you were thinking of doing research on prisoners, allow a lot of time, a lot, a lot of time, because there are additional requirements that take a long time to get a review approved. Okay. Like, for instance, one of the things, if you want to do a study involving prisoners, or you want to amend a study to recruit prisoners, everything has to be reviewed full board. We'll talk about that. And there has to be a prisoner representative at the meeting to advocate for the prisoner. So there are additional protections. That we see students sometimes, they're like, I want to do my dissertation on prisoners. And I'm like, really? I mean, if you do, let's start in year one. Because, you know, you want to get, you want to graduate, too. Not that we want to discourage it. But, you know, because like you said, I think, you know, you made an important guess that maybe prisoners are excluded. It's like, well, that's not deliberate. <laughs> it's just they're seen as having additional protections because they have diminished autonomy and capacity. All right. Uh, pregnant women, uh, mentally disabled persons. This is part of the uh, code that is further being updated from a definitions perspective and the forthcoming changes that I can show out there because that probably won't you, but you know, it, it talks about the take-home point here is that there are vulnerable populations that have additional subparts. Okay, the subparts are there. Subpart B is where you can see additional uh, regulations if you want to target pregnant women and fetuses from home. Okay, the key there is they have to be like targeted. That's like who you are explicitly trying to target. Okay, if you're doing a mental risk study that may include some women who might be pregnant or are pregnant, that's a different story. Okay, these are for, you know, if you want to do a research study where you seek your, one of your inclusion criteria, it, one of your inclusion criteria is pregnant women. Okay, uh, the fetuses are the inmates. So part C is where you get the prisoners, and we talked a little bit about those additional requirements. So part D is kids. Kids are also seen as having diminished autonomy, diminished capacity um, to make their own decisions. Obviously it varies by state. In West Virginia, um, the age of consent is 18, unless you're an emancipated minor, which we don't see in any of those. Um, that varies by states. Most states are probably 18, but it really goes at what is the legal age of consent in the state, okay, to, to, to where it's at. Uh, if any of you have teenagers, you might know that before they're 18, they think they can make their own decisions, but the law says we'll get them until he's 18. <laughs> Um, to go there. All right. Impaired subjects, at least right now, don't have a specific subpart, but it's an important consideration when the IRB reviews the protocol. If you have subjects that might be impaired, perhaps dementia issues or otherwise, um, they're considered vulnerable, and a lot of times the IRB would then use subpart B as a guidance with, with kids, and those are things like you know consent by you know a proxy or another person, um, additional safeguards as well. Um, all right, questions on that? Okay, I have one. Yep. So I, I've, I've seen different, you know, things pop up in email, different research going on with, like, women with, you know, new babies or whatever. Um, it, is this only involving if there's drug involved, like, research? Yeah, so... so what, what I'm saying, like... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 that's a very good question. Subpart B, or at least how we do it here, here at WDA, is we look at uh, and, and the line of demarcation is, is your research targeting one of these specific vulnerable groups? Okay, obviously, the answer nobody likes is each protocol is different because there's a lot of gray when you're doing research with human subjects. In that case, a decision, when you do have to make a decision, you know, 
do we now have to follow the original requirements and stuff like that? Okay. Uh, and we essentially um, look at whether or not it's minimal versus more than minimal. Risk. That's one. I mean, another consideration is if, if is it funded by the federal government. If it's not funded by the federal government, our SOPs give us a little more flexibility where we can sit there and say, okay, even though pregnant women are involved, it's minimal risk, so we can go ahead and say we we don't necessarily need to follow subpart B. So it's a long answer winded way of saying if if we see an, if we see a protocol where pregnant women are involved, we do have to look both at the regulations and our standard operating procedures and make a determination. Do we have to follow the additional requirements in subpart B? And if we do, then that might mean additional requirements for clinical coordinators and, and, and investigators. Does that answer your question? Kind of, yeah. So you said about drugs, because I, I want to make sure I answered. Well, question. we work, you know, clinical research, right. Right, drug study. So you know, all this comes back to what we do. But when I see, you know, things come across where it's like maybe just like questions, or you meet with a person and uh -huh. it's questions regarding your child, and you know. Like in the end, they give you like a twenty-five dollar gift card or something, you know. So they're being paid, but there's nothing involved other than questions. So that's right. So, that's so a lot, that's right. So in a lot of cases, it might well be in that situation that subpart B we don't have to go to because it might be minimal risk, but it does depend on the overall. But it uh, all goes in front of the hour. But all does, and and so we always have in the back of our mind: if we see pregnant, we've got to see: are we required now? To do the additional protections, which is based on the whole risk, based on things like that. So that that will work. Yeah. If not, we can stop. Yeah, it does. I'm sure you're that's right. All right, great. Thank you. Any other questions on this? No. Excited for that. Okay. All right. When I talk about this in my class, I come with some notoriously very horrible jokes. And I often say that like, you know, I know some good jokes, but if I call them, if I hold them, I'd be fired. You know, I would never let them teach in front of college students again. Um, but you know, I do because you have to. I mean, you have to come up with like corny stuff, like you know, guy walked into a bar, ouch, I and mean, stuff like that. That's why I do this for a living and stuff because he walked into a bar. You got it. This is why I'm doing this. This is why I'm not doing that. All right. So what does an IRB look like? Okay. An IRB, and this is all, and the reason why I put up like the various parts of 45 CFR 46, which will change. Is not because to, for to have you memorize those. You know, you might see a question on just overall 45 CFR 46. Now, I don't know that they'll get into these specific actual subparts and decimal places and everything else. The reason why I put this up is again, take on point that all of this ties back to 45 CFR 46. So, what it says is, is you have to have at least five members. Okay, so there is no legal jurisdiction for an IRB. Okay, so because of that, this is why you can have for profit IRBs. Okay, Chesapeake, some of the studies you do, you know, CTRU and, and otherwise can use Chesapeake, which is a commercial for profit IRB. And that's because there's no jurisdictional issues. Now, there are organizational policies. So, like if you are a WU employee, you know, staff member or whatever else, at some point you're probably going to have to engage WU IRB. But there are no jurisdictional issues. Okay. But you have to have at least five members. So Mon, uh, Mon General can have an IRB. In fact, they do have an IRB. But any IRB, no matter where you are, has to have at least five members. You can have more, but you can't have less than five. Okay? They've got to be from diverse backgrounds. Hopefully this is self evident. Okay, the last thing that you want to have an IRB, you want to have it happen in an IRB is group. You do not want everyone thinking the same way. Because that's not fulfilling your mission of protecting subjects and maximizing the ethical principles, guiding research with subjects. When I was chair of the IRB, I used to say time and time again, please, if you don't agree, speak up. Okay? We're all a family, we can all be friends at the end of the day, but we need that. And I always encourage that, because you just don't want everybody unanimously voting the same way all the time. Okay? So diverse backgrounds, what does that mean? One of them, we actually have to record every meeting which one was the scientist. Okay, and the regulations actually say this is somebody with a terminal degree, terminal condition. Okay, MD, BBS, PhD, some combination thereof. Okay, one's got to be a non scientist. The regulations are less clear on what this means. It typically, by default, goes to a member that is not, does not have a terminal degree or some type of advanced scientific training. But we've got to record that. 
And if we don't, we can get in trouble. If we have time, we'll talk about what happens if the IRB messes up. Okay, so it's because it's not very good things. Okay. Um, for instance, our non-scientists, a lot of times, uh, we usually have a clergy uh, or a pastor from the community, which may also uh, serve as the so-called community member. Okay. The community member, I like the idea, you know, of somebody actually from the community in which the research is done. I mean, I think that makes sense. I think most of us would agree that if IRBs existed uh, when Tuskegee was going around, and you had a member of the African American community in which the Tuskegee study was being done, it would have never been approved. Okay. The problem is because there's no jurisdiction on IRBs, technically it's just a person that is not affiliated with the institution, which again is why you can now have commercial IRBs. Okay. So here what that means is that we have to have somebody on the WBU IRB that is not affiliated with WBU. Which is typically like a local pastor or somebody else. Okay, I do. I personally like the idea of throwing somebody from the community in which your research is going to be done. But technically, that's not the case. Although sometimes you will hear them referred to as community members. Okay, um, and you have to achieve quorum. And this is huge. A lot of times it might be a simple majority. You take in how many members you have and whatever a simple majority is. But you have got to achieve quorum. If you do not have quorum, you cannot have a meeting. Okay. It has not happened uh, in a long, long time, but way back in the day, I can remember being in an IRB meeting. Of course, this is back when we had KC. I don't want to talk about KC. Okay. But this is back when they had like you know our protocols, which were almost as tall as me, which doesn't mean much, but still, you can imagine that's a big stack of papers. Okay, um, and people couldn't get in, or they'd have to leave because it was going too long, or they couldn't get in because of the snowstorm, and you have to stop the meeting. Now, you have just spent all that time putting together a beautiful protocol, now in the system, and you get a nice little note from Leo, uh, she's still here, that says, sorry, we didn't achieve quorum, we had to stop the meeting, it'll be scheduled for the next one. Yeah, I mean, blood pressure, through the road, everything else, but you have, you cannot have a meeting. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, I know, you did it right, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. You cannot have a meeting. And if you have a meeting when you don't have quorum, you can get in lots of trouble, which we can talk about. But you've got to have quorum, so that's a take-home point. So we do everything we can now to promote quorum, like you know, stacking the deck with alternate members and things that are all legal, but just to really promote our ability to make sure that happens. You guys put in too much time. Okay, it's already frustrating as it is. Okay, to have that happen. So you have to have quorum. All right. So there are three primary levels of review. There's exempt review. Expedited and quorum. Okay? Um, exempt, and this is an area, again, not to be confusing, but this is going to be expanded in okay, the revisions. But typically, by definition, these are minimal risk studies. Okay, uh, Currently, at least, until it's, it's revised, they fall into six categories. And examples are like anonymous survey, chart reviews if you don't retain any identifiers, that's a technicality, educational research. The take home point for you is. Two things. One, it doesn't mean exempt from review. <laughs> That's a big point. Okay, most institutions still require that one person takes a look at it to make sure that two, it fits into one of the six categories. Okay, worst thing I ever had to do as a chair, well, a lot of worse things other than five hour deposition, um, was we had a student, very well meaning student, that actually took it upon themselves to read 45 CFR 46 and decided on their own that what they were doing was exempt and started doing it. So we got complaints of potential non-compliance because the student was actually in the class setting and had to go investigate and found out that it wasn't exempt. Uh, even if it were exempt, it should have been, you know, at least reviewed and, and acknowledged as such. And then that student lost all of the data they had collected and I think there were some academic grounds as well. It was awful. So just remember, please check. Okay, it's still got to be submitted at least here. It usually has to be reviewed by one person and it has to fit into one of these prescribed categories. Okay, so that's exempt research. The other two, which is probably more in the world you live in, are expedited or full board, you know, quorum research. And whether or not it goes full board or expedited is solely driven by, well, 90 some percent driven by level of risk. Okay. Um, if it's minimal risk and it fits into one of nine expedited categories, then your research can be reviewed expedited, which means essentially by one member 
we try to turn those around within a week to 10 days, okay, at least the initial review. Okay. Minimal risk, you can see the definition of 45 CFR 46 essentially means do the procedures as described in the research study contain a level of risk that is similar to what one would experience during the course of daily living or during the course of routine psychological or medical tests. Okay, the bottom line is, is it's subjective, okay, and you have to make a judgment call. Originally, you know, initially, the investigator makes the call. The principal investigator puts it in and says, I think this is not a risk, or I think this is more than a risk. The IRB can disagree, and it can get bumped up. Now, I'm sure some of you have had that happen. It can get bumped up to, to a higher level of review. But that's essentially what drives it. Okay. You do have to fit into nine, there are nine expedited categories of which the first seven are the only things you'd ever see. But the first and foremost thing is what is that level of risk? Okay, what is that level of risk? All right. Um, so the board then, whether or not we're reviewing it expedited or full board, we meet here at WBU the second and fourth Wednesday of the month. We have a blue board and a gold board. Surprise. Um, and they have what I consider to be very generous deadlines. You can essentially get scheduled to have your protocol reviewed if it's a week before the meeting, which is very generous. If it comes in Wednesday before the meeting, you can, first and third Wednesday, you can typically get scheduled on the agenda uh, to have a review. All right, so when we review it, we can do a couple of things. We can approve it, yay, disapprove it, can't say those words, make you thinking, okay, or we can defer, meaning that we don't have enough. I can tell you disapproval is very rare. Okay, in 10 years I've been on the board, I've only seen maybe 10 of these. What do you think is the number one ethical principle that almost always leads to a disapproval? In almost all cases. Risk is not right. You're exactly right. Beneficence. Because with respect for persons, we can work with the investigator to modify the consent form. In justice, you can usually work and say expand your sample or do things like that. But at the end of the day, if the risks outweigh the benefits, we can't approve it. We just can't approve it. And that's happened a handful of times. That's happened a handful of times. But it's rare. Typically, we can defer it or you know, send it back and eventually, hopefully, you get approval. Okay, very important point though, only the full board can disapprove research. So I'm one of the designated expedited reviewers now at the university, and if I get a protocol that comes in and I think that there's a beneficence criterion violation, I cannot, as one person, say this is disapproved. Okay, it has to go to the full board and then they have to agree or disagree. Okay, after that, there's nobody, I mean, that's that's it. I mean, there's nobody else that can overturn that at the university. And that makes sense why that would be, so that you can operate independently. Okay. Um, but that's an important point. Only the full board can disapprove it. Continuing review, this is another thing the IRBs do, that we have the, uh, you know, after we've approved research, within one year, we need to look at it again, if it's an expedited or if it's a full board study. It could be sooner, especially if there's a lot of risks involved, but no later than one year, we've got to take a look at it. Okay, we don't need to get in trouble. Okay, we can also observe the consent process uh, uh, to make sure of everything. But this is very important. We've got to make sure, you know, some studies I've seen where the board has said, you know, we're not sure about this, but, you know, why don't we give it three months and then we'll ask for how it's going or something else. But no later than one year. That's an important point. All right, drug studies. We doing okay? No, this is like a lot of information. You doing all right? I promise to look at your time. If you have to go, you have to go. Um, keep going. All right, drug studies. How many of you are involved in drug studies? Quite a few, I think. Yeah, almost everybody. Great. All right. So almost all of these are reviewed. Well, all of them at WD are reviewed full board. Okay. Um, that is a, an organizational decision here. There is an expedited uh, category one that I think that we have and moving more towards like registry studies, phase four studies. Um, there is an expedited category one where all you're doing is observing what happens to people that are prescribed a marketed drug according to label. You know, then there is an expedited category for that. But here we typically like to see all drugs because and definitely on investigational drugs, you don't know what all the risks might be. And most of them 
you know, really are probably going to go beyond that definition of minimal risk. You know, if you're in a drug study, this probably exceeds what you would be experiencing in daily life, okay, or when you go to the doctor just for routine things, all right? Um, so a drug, and this is interesting, you can have an investigational drug, and that's where you'll have to have an IND. So you probably see this with a lot of your submission packets, that in the United States, you can't test a drug in human beings unless you have an IND that is uh, issued by the FDA. You have to have that. You can't do it. It's not Europe, maybe a little different, but here you have to have an IND. So that's one of the things we ask the IRB, where's your IND? Okay. If it's an investigational new drug, meaning that it's not been otherwise approved for anything, okay? Or it can be an existing drug, and this is very common, that is being used off label. So if you want to basically test, in, in the example I give, the amitriptyline, Elevil, is, uh, is a tricyclic antidepressant that was originally approved for uh, as an antidepressant. It's, not, it's no longer used for that. Um, the SSRIs um, basically replace the tricyclics, but it is commonly now prescribed for neuropathy in my case. And so if you wanted to do a study saying, you know, I want to prescribe patients amitriptyline uh, for neuropathy, then what you're doing is an approved drug, but it's being used off label. Okay, so that's an important distinction. Here you don't need an IND because it's being used off label. Unless, when we get into that, the drug company actually wants to obtain empirical evidence to then be able to market it in a different way. So your drug rep with amitriptyline in, in this example, okay, could say, this is FDA approved for depression, and that's it. So if they wanted their drug reps to be able to say, this is FDA approved for depression and neuropathy, then they'd have to go back, get an IND, again, because now they're wanting a label to change. Otherwise, a lot of these studies are off-label, okay, because they're wanting to provide evidence, scientific evidence, that might influence the way physicians prescribe that, okay, but it's on a drug that's already been approved for something else. So it's off-label use. All right. Um, and this is what I just talked about here. It doesn't require an IND. Uh, if it meets requirements for an IND exemption. And an IND exemption, this is lengthy, you can read about this, but essentially the take home point to all this is what you're doing is not to change the marketing label. What you're doing is you're not looking to be able to sell it or market it for a different clinical indication. Okay? And you can read about that. All right, so device studies, these get even more confusing. Drugs are Pretty straightforward. You either have a, if it's a new drug that's never been approved, you got an IND. If it's an existing drug that's been approved and either you want to test it off label or you want to go back and get a new IND to test it for and be able to market it for a new condition. So those are drugs. All right? We look at all those in the, in, in the, uh, the IRB packet. All right? Device studies are a little different and they get a little confusing because the first thing an IRB has to do is they have to say, is this a significant risk device? Or is this a non-significant risk device? Okay, SR versus NSR. Okay. Significant risk device, you can read about that. You see where I have bolded, it's just that potential for serious risk. Okay, obviously, if you're using an aneurysm coil, that's going to be a significant risk device. If you're using an ultrasound, unless you've got it cranked way up, your typical ultrasound machine is not going to be a significant risk device. Okay. And you can read about that, but it really just gets back to how. You know, does it potentially, uh, could it cause great harm um, to you know, bodily function uh, or even life itself, all right? So the first thing the IRB has to do is say, is it an SR or is it an NSR? If it is a significant risk device, this is where we're going to get into what I thought would be an amazing, an amazing, uh, if, if I'm not a metalhead, believe it or not, people like how and I'm like, well, you got money to go to concerts, you know, and stuff. And so I'd like, you know, look the look. But you know, I mean, like, I'm a huge metal band. And I've always thought, like, if I was able to have a metal band, like, the best name of that metal band would be Semantic Nightmares. You know, like, if you just, like, now open and find Iron Maiden, which is, like, the greatest band of all time, Semantic Nightmares. Because we're going to get into Semantic Nightmares. Okay? You got the IND for drug studies. Okay? With device studies, if it's a significant risk device, it has to have an IDP, 
which is confusing because the E in that is exemption. Okay, but bear with me. I, B, E. Okay, the sponsor is the person that first says, I think this is an SR, one an SR. The IRB can then agree upon it. Okay, what helps the sponsor's cause is if they first went to the FDA and got some ruling as to what it is. Okay, if not, the IRB then has to agree or disagree, and if the sponsor and the IRB are doing this, then the FDA has to break the, the top, so to speak, or you know, basically be the design, deciding vote. Okay? Um, you obviously shouldn't just rely totally on the minimal risk definition that we talked about for expedited review. It's based on that other definition that I threw up. Okay? But the bigger, bigger thing to remember for you is if it's SR, then it requires an IDE. <laughs> an IDE number. Okay? So now it's going to get even more fun. So there's IDE. Right for SR studies, significant risk devices. Okay, you can't begin until the FDA has approved the IDE application. See what I mean? All right. So the FDA, just like drugs, the FDA, if you're using a significant risk device, it has to have FDA approval before you can test it in humans. And in this case, it's an IDE, not an IND. Okay. Here we go. This is going to get more fun. Now there are certain studies that have an IDE exemption. But what I like to say is IDE squared because the first E is exemption unless I'm missing something. All right. So these are studies essentially, and, and, and there's criteria like everything. Okay. Um, if they're exempt from the IDE requirements, uh, the uh, the IRB then doesn't need to document whether or not they think it's a significant risk versus a non-significant risk uh, device. Okay. We do have to document in our meeting minutes what factors led to our SR versus our NSR designation, okay? Um, the IDE exemptions, the best thing I can say is go to our standard operating procedures and what they are, but they are essentially things similar to, I mean, there's one like if it existed before 1976, or are you using something that is similar to what is already marketing? Like an example of um, devices I've seen that or IDE exempt, or like a lot of your biometrics, like your fingerprint scanners and things like that, but they still have to fit into that kind of category. Everything has to be documented. What you have to remember from that semantic nightmare is SRs require an IDE. NSRs, okay, might have an IDE exemption, is a lot of times what happens. Because if it's not significant risk, the FDA has said to the IRB, you can oversee this study. If it's significant risk, remember I talked about that, the FDA has to approve, you know, the IDE before you can even, you know, get approval from the IRB. If it's not significant risk, the FDA has said the IRB can be the final stop, the local IRB. So that's the other thing as well. This is just a way of saying that we are responsible for records retention. And one of the things I have like highlighted there, and this is something IRBs can get in trouble for, we have to keep minutes of all of our meetings, all of the research proposals, like everything they do has to be kept, and that's federal law. Okay, that's just a point you may see on your uh, exam, but uh, you know, that's an important point. All right, um, obviously our SOPs, has anybody seen our SOPs on our website? Very comprehensive, I think very well done. Um, a lot of times if you have a question, you can look at those as well. As a reviewer, the former chair, sometimes if people were ask me a question, a lot of times I'll even you know, like 260 pages now. You know, I'm not Shelly. You know, I'm Big Bang Theory and everything else. So my wife does like to call me Shelly Leonard's because I look like Leonard and sometimes I can act like Wally gets the Shelly. And she's probably got something there. But that's her little amalgamation. Okay. All right. Um, so it's just important to know. And again, there's our standard operating procedures. There's the link to it. But they, it should go without saying now that they are based directly on 45 CFR 46. And this is what we use as a guidance as well, both during our meetings and when we're doing our, our, our proposals. All right, let's see where we are. How are we doing? We know we're right on time. I know it's about the hour. What did they tell you about one and what did they say an hour and a half? We're going to shoot to end up before that. Wouldn't that be nice? I don't want to like break the card and rule or uh, you know, tell people you're going to end up early and then you don't. It's like that's the worst thing you can ever do, so I'm not going to do that. All right. But we talked about why we have IRBs. We spent a good bit of time here on specifics. 
you know, how we do what we do, why we do it, how we do it, which is based on 45 CFR 46. And there are some FDA regulations. I guess I failed to mention that. I mean, nobody ever, I don't think that I'm probably going to be the first person that's ever said that the federal government should be confusing. Uh, and typically what has happened is, is you had 45 CFR 46 and then a lot of your individual federal agencies said, no, we want to create our own. But in most cases, they ended up being almost identical <laughs> to 45 CFR 46. So many of you who work in drug studies are probably more familiar with seeing things like 21 CFR 50 something. Well, that's the FDA regs that are essentially very similar to 45 CFR. CFR means Code of Federal Regulations, 46. Okay. So what can happen if we don't do it right? Well, there's something called the research debt penalty. And this is where the federal government can suspend. And this is probably even a worse bad day in the office than the uh, opening video that we watched. The federal government can come in and shut down research in, at an institution. And overnight, if you're uh, an institution that has hundreds of millions of dollars in federal funds, they can just stop it overnight. Okay. Um, and has it happened? Yeah, it has. Uh, it happened to Duke. This is in 1999. Okay, they came in at that time, this is in 1999 dollars, Duke got about 175 million a year okay, in federal funding. So what happened? Look at this. Documented a long list of failings, most of them related to the Center's Institutional Review Board. Okay. They came in and shut it down okay, because of some of the things they did. Look at this. IRB was not keeping adequate written documentation as required in 45 CFR 46. How I decided to allow various studies to go forward? And to document that in the meeting minutes. Okay? Discrepancies between the number of IRB members present and the number of votes. Quorum issues. Remember, I told you that it's going to come back to haunt you. You've got to have a quorum or you stop the meeting. Okay? And conflict of interest. We could spend a whole two hours on that, right? Okay? Conflict of interest issues. The conflict of interest is, is a huge issue now. Because, and again, there's a separate conflict of uh, interest set, uh, wing in the Office of Research Integrity and Compliance. But it's something that you know, we, we have to keep in mind at the IRB level as well. There are several times where I have been on studies, I've done some studies with Pat and the, and the neurology group there, and I've been like a blinded you know, assessor. And when those studies have come up for review at the IRB, I have to step out of the room. And that, I have to identify the conflict of interest. They have to document that. I have to step out of the room. They have to document that I was not present because they take that very seriously because they want it to be as objective as possible. Okay, so they shut it down. Johns Hopkins, a couple of years later. Okay, death of a young healthy volunteer in an asthma study that will usually trigger some additional review. Okay, look what a fail. Failure to approve every study in a convened meeting of the institutional review board. Lack of proper informed consent. Exposure of subjects to a drug not approved for human use, no IND, and failure to report adverse reactions. Okay, so it's very serious. Okay, if we don't do it right, it can hurt the institution. It can hurt individual investigators, and it can hurt the institution. I think that's something that it's very fair to say I didn't always have insight into or remember when I was going through a period of frustration reading my most request, most recent request for revisions. Okay? So it helped me to understand kind of why we do what we do, how we do it, what can happen if we do it wrong. Okay. Well, what would you do? Okay. Some of you may have seen these get a little dated now, so if you have, please hold your, you know, if you know the answer for everybody else who hasn't seen it, all right, 2010, who's heard of this one? I mean, I've probably been giving this talk for a while, so some of you may have seen it. Anybody heard of this case? Two UC Davis neurosurgeons, okay? Uh, it's a little more recent than Tuskegee and some of the other cases, Henry Lax. So they basically had an idea that in their glioblastoma patients are absolutely poor for cancer. I think the median survival rate is like 11 months. And that's just kind of the, the, the median. It's a uh, horrible brain cancer. And they decided that they, they wanted to inject probiotics, you know, into the these patients' heads, essentially, inside of the glioblastoma, to see if they could cause an infection under the hypothesis that the body's immune response would be stimulated to fight 
the infection. Okay, it's not a bad idea, you know, in and of itself. Okay, so this is what you see. This comes to you, all right? So the first question is, do you think in this case that IRB re reviews required wire one? Before or after they did it? Let's just say, right now, in general, this is the idea. Do you think that it's required? And yes, also, do you think it's required before or after? So I would, yeah, what's the answer to both of those questions? Yes, yes, and why? Before and then I review after. Right, so before, okay, and yes, and why yes? It's human beings, right? So there's, there, there's actually a research definition, and that's something that's getting modified as well, but I'm not going to, like, you know, um, muddy the waters, but you have to decide whether or not something's research. And obviously, it's got to be research done on human beings. Okay? You have to then, uh, you know, in, in you're interacting with them, you're obtaining private information, okay, or you're doing some type of intervention to them, and you're doing this for the purposes of creating generalizable knowledge. Okay, that's essentially the federal definition of research. So in this case, it's on humans. It's fair to say that what they're doing in they works, they would share. So they want to contribute to generalizable knowledge. And it has to be some type of systematic investigation. Okay, so for all of those reasons, we would say yes, this requires IRB review. Okay, and I would also say yes before. <laughs> and if we're terminally ill, then you might not be able to consent for that. So yeah, you see you got it all right. That's 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 a huge issue that we go through. All right, so you got that. What level of review? Of the three. Exam text would I have four. Four. Why? <clears throat> Let's say you're an expedited reviewer of this comes to you. What are you going to do? The level of risk. Sorry? The level of risk. Level of risk. You got it. In fact, I think all of us can agree that opening or having our heads opened up and having probiotics, you know, bacteria essentially squirted in there uh, is not something that is kind of a routine medical practice or that we just kind of do every day for fun. Right, so exactly right, okay. We decided that this requires review because it's on humans, it's a systematic investigation and it's designed to contribute to generalizable knowledge. We decided that this is clearly more than minimal risk and yes, we want to see it before it starts, right? Okay, so you see it at the full board. Relevant ethical questions, you already mentioned one, very good. You said terminally ill patients may have which of the three principles common? Respect for persons, what you said, because you said because they, they might be, you basically said they're under duress, yeah. right? And so because of that, you've got to wonder do they truly have the full capacity to consent? Because we talk about capacity to consent, or are they willing to do anything before truly being able to consider what are the risks and benefits to make a full, fully informed decision? So informed consent and autonomy. So that's very good. All right, and so you got that right away. Right. Didn't even know it, but you could be on the IRB. See? You could be on the IRB. Didn't even know. Never know. You might be recruited. All right. Beneficence, what do you think? What would you want to know? So the beneficence criterion is set is maximizing benefits and minimizing risk. What information would you like to have um, if you're reviewing this program? What would you want to know to help you weigh whether or not beneficence is maximized? That's right. That's right. A lot of times we want to see is there any other animal in the clinical studies? You know, has this been tried before? Both in animal models or maybe even in other humans, right? Okay. What do you think happened with this one? In this case, there were only clinical antidotes. The FDA had actually required more animal studies okay, related to this item. Okay. What about justice? Because what I told you is what IRBs do is we're looking at each protocol policy does it maximize respect to persons, beneficence, and justice. In this case, you know, the small sample size, you're not really probably targeting a particular group or excluding a group, but you should always keep that in the back of your mind. Okay? What did the UC Davis IRB decide in this case? Ready for it? Ready for it? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's not good. It was never 
submitted for full review. So what happened was the PI saw what's called emergency use of a test article. Okay, this is something that allows, if you have an investigational drug, so here's the first thing, it still has to have an IMD. Okay, you can't just be anything that's study and have an IMD or the FDA doesn't even know about it. Okay. But if you have something that has been granted an IMD that you have not had time to go through your institution's IRB and receive approval to use it, and you see a patient as a physician, okay, um, and they're going to die. There's just not time to get IRB approval. And you truly think, in your own opinion, that this could save their life. You can go to the IRB and the IRB chair and say, I would like to invoke emergency use of test All right. And if the chair agrees, and there's like documentation, you also have to have another clinician that you know agrees with like the department chair agrees as well, then you can use it in one and only one patient. If you want to use it more than once, then you've got to turn around and submit a book. Because you can't then use that argument twice. Okay, so you can use it in one and only one. Okay? They used it in three. <laughs> so what happened to the three? Two developed sepsis and died, one developed a wound infection, the antibiotics, and ultimately later died. Okay? What happened to the investigators? Well, both of them were barred from ever conducting research again. One of them was the chair of neurosurgery, and it was an endowed chair. So um, I think he's probably still practicing there, but he's probably not doing research. The other one was a junior junior level investigator and probably derailed his academic career with the kids. Okay. Uh, they never do it again. All right. Um, the FDA had to go and do an audit that you just you don't you don't want that to happen. Okay, that's just awful to happen. And that could trigger and the university had to self report this because they try to be proactive. All right, so take home points. Yeah, you guys have been great. You know, it's like a lot of information not available even after the fact. Shoot me an email, whatever, if you want to chat about this. 45 CFR 46 is the blueprint for IRBs. Um, this is what we use uh, in, in everything we do as a guidance. We are required to develop SOPs based on 45 CFR 46, which we have done. The IRB membership, I hope I've impressed, should be diverse and include what I would argue is community representation, although technically it was a member that's not affiliated with the institution. Level of review is driven by level of risk. More than minimal risk is full board review. Minimal risk and minimal risk studies that fit into one of nine categories can be expedited. Drug studies require IRB review and may require an IMD from the FDA if it's not a situation where you're using a drug off-label, okay, you're testing a drug off-label. Device studies require the IRB to make a risk determination, and if there's any back and forth disagreement, then the FDA can make the final determination, okay. And that typically only happens if the sponsor says this is not significant risk, and the IRB says no, we think it's significant risk. But the FDA can make the final determination, okay. Failure of the IRB can lead to suspension of all federally funded research at a university, um, which is a very, very bad thing. Very costly, very bad. I'm done. Did I do it? Yeah, I did. All right. Thank you. Questions? It's a lot. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 no. Okay, so you, back to the point of, you know, with the question, are there studies on other, like, animals? So you look at, like a study that I read where metformin was used, was proved to kill cancer, breast cancer cells in like lab rats. So if that comes to the IRB and say we want to do that study on humans, does that, they look at that and say, well, you know, we've already started studying this, this could be good. That they How absolutely, that? Yeah, they absolutely will look at it. I think, I mean, honestly, a lot of the studies you're involved with, a lot of studies like the CQRU is involved with, and even some of the ones that neurology is involved with, have already been vetted by the FDA. And that's something that's helpful to IRBs, even though we still look at it. They usually come with really lengthy, pre-formatted uh, investigator brochures and actual clinical protocols with, with all of that information in there, which makes it really easy for the IRB to go through and talk about here the animal studies, and here the toxicology studies, here the pharmacokinetics, and here where if it's done on the phase one studies, you know, I don't know, in phase one, phase two. Phase one is basically 
feeling about it. You know, phase two is a little bit more safety and a dosing gradient. You know, phase three then is your efficacy trial. Phase four is post-marketing. So absolutely, they'll be looking at it. Fortunately, with a lot of those, it helps that the FDA has all, already looked at it and consider that information for an IND. So they, the FDA requires some of similar information to even grant an IND to be tested in humans because they're looking at risk versus benefits. But we still look at it as well. I have one more. Yeah. So, okay, just an example of like, you know, we do a study and, you know, once the sponsor gets everything and the study fails, so then the scientist has to reformulate their drug. Does that help with getting, like, is that a, an expedited? You know, it would never be we're going to redo it like yeah. that in the new protocol. Does that help? Get it, it doesn't change the level of risk. I think that's a very good good question. Um, it whether or not it would help the beneficence consideration is going to directly be based on what happened. So you now have evidence on what would be rate of like adverse rate and nature of adverse events. And you know if they were really nasty and bad, then that may just stop it from ever being used in, in humans again. I mean, obviously, why? You know, pharmaceutical research in, in, in the FDA and IRBs, that all came about because of the thalidomide trials. Okay, and they had talked about that so called morning sickness drug that caused horrible uh, birth defects uh, in babies uh, in what, the 60s, 1960s. And at that time, I mean, that, that's where we re really got additional regulations from the FDA about, you know, looking at risk versus benefits and what exists. You know, in terms of pre-existing studies uh, for drugs, uh, so it really just depends on what happened before. Because the thalidomide is now used as a cancer drug, all right. So it was now looked at as okay. You know, we know where we can't use it. We know what can happen, but it's now been successful I think, in treating certain cancers. I don't mean to misspeak, but so it really just depends on what happened before. It will absolutely be. But anyway, I appreciate it. Uh, you know, if you have any other questions, just email me or whatever else. I'm sure this will be available to you. And I uh, hope you have a good rest of the day.